or just the next extra step on someone's journey to independence or self-sufficiency. Awareness is a big start. We want to use that awareness and that information to change behavior. The container that you've been using to put yard trimmings in, you can now put in food scraps. Hi, I'm Dachbar Timmer, and you're watching The Sustainable Region. And I'm Vanessa Timmer. Today we're at Granville Island to talk about food waste. Of course, most people visiting this popular foodie shopping mecca are in there, not out here by the bins. But these bins do tell an important story about how we deal with food waste. Most places simply throw it away and it ends up in the landfill. Some 95,000 tons of it every year from commercial sources. But not from here. The businesses at Granville Island Market participate in an active composting program with a central collection area that makes pickup from all these businesses economically viable. Well, if only it were this easy for businesses across Metro Vancouver. This is a problem that will have to be solved in the near future. Whereas we're about to find out, Granville Island is not alone in breaking new ground. It's the start of another day at Quest Outreach a non-profit organization that wouldn't exist without the excess amount of food produced by the food industry. Ideally we wouldn't want Quest to exist at all because we wouldn't have any food waste, but because we do we've decided to be proactive about it and take our own approach to reduce the effect of food waste on the environment. Quest receives almost four million dollars worth of donated food every year from grocery stores, food suppliers and restaurants. Food that would otherwise go to waste ending up in the landfill, creating greenhouse gases. Here, at one of three low-cost grocery stores operated by Quest, low-income clients referred by social service agencies buy the food they want at subsidized prices, instead of receiving food for free. At Quest, we realize the importance of a food bank, but they do give a handout, and here we try to give people a hand up have a more dignified food buying experience where they can come and purchase their own food based on what they want to eat and not what someone else thinks they need. We're just the next extra step on someone's journey to independence or self-sufficiency. Quest also receives unused food from a few restaurants, but with well over a thousand eating establishments in the city of Vancouver, Quest estimates that only one percent of restaurant food waste is being donated. That means a huge amount of organic waste from the region's eateries is headed straight to the landfill. But not so at Trafalgar's Bistro. Here, patrons can enjoy the food and the fact that the restaurant diverts 95% of its waste instead of sending it to the landfill. Customers just can't believe that we're doing it. There's tons of positive response and every time Someone is just amazed at how much work this must be. They say, oh, it must be so hard. And, and for us, that's the most surprising, surprising thing. It's actually been so easy. The area behind the restaurant tells the story. Waste is separated into a multitude of recycling bins. And all of Trafalgar's organic waste goes into this machine, an on-site composter. That's good for the environment, of course. But it also makes economic sense. It's very expensive to remove waste and so we were getting our big dumpster tipped four times per week and the total cost on that was about a thousand dollars per month. We've done lots of calculations and this machine will pay for itself in approximately two years and after that we'll be making a profit. We're in partnership with Inner City Farms and they send a representative once per week to come and harvest the compost out of the machine. It goes to gardens all over the city. Food waste is a chronic problem in the restaurant business. I remember when nothing was recycled, even um, the paper from the computer systems were all gone to landfill. By and large, it's a very wasteful industry. It stems from a lack of care, and everyone falls prey to it, uh, myself included. There's times when you're just in a rush and you're busy, and the easiest thing to do is to throw it out. Like many aspiring cooks, Chef Matthew Villamoran started his career in the dish pit. He believes the amount of waste that gets scraped off the plate is evidence that portions are often too big. You want to get the most bang for your buck, so you get a lot of food. But if you're not going to eat it, 
and you're not going to take it home. It's just going to go to waste. So I think a lot of that can be solved by the restaurants themselves, by portion control and making sure that you're giving the right amount of food. Metro Vancouver is phasing in a ban on organics from the commercial sector by 2015. But this restaurant is already ahead of the curve. This will be a ball that's in everyone's court in just a couple of years. So we've just taken the ball by the horns and chosen to be an industry leader to prove that it's very easy and it's just the right thing to do. Individual efforts, whether at a restaurant or a service agency like Quest, are a step in the right direction. But commercial food waste still represents the region's largest source of organic waste at 95,000 tons every year. That's a lot of garbage to divert from the landfill by 2015, and a lot of attitudes about food waste that need to change. Welcome back to the sustainable region. Granville Island is a cornucopia, but what isn't consumed or composted will be banned from the landfill. Don't miss the 2012 Zero Waste Challenge Conference on September 14th to hear waste reduction tactics and learn from the experts. Up next, highlights from the 2011 Zero Waste Challenge Conference. If you want to have a project like this succeed, you have to bring all the stakeholders together. We've got the composters, we've got marketers, uh, we've got zero waste consultants and haulers and, uh, and end users, obviously. We want to hear what you, you feel are the barriers, as we said earlier, the barriers to going forward, and then what additional actions you suggest. 
whatever we can do as uh, local and regional government to encourage people to understand why we're asking them to do this and I think that's a real major part of the education. Regulatory agencies, municipal governments, and local advocates in the U.S. have over the last two decades all too often focused primarily upon the role of residents in the achieving of substantial diversion rates, while at the same time not noting nor properly focusing upon the fact that commercial and in particular manufacturing or industrial waste constitutes a far greater portion of the nation's waste stream. It's great to see so much uh, um, participation yeah. in all these things. You know, I know the conference was sold out, but I think Metro did a great job, and all the staff and, and politicians did a great job. I deal with multifamily dwellings, and I live in a multifamily dwellings, and multifamily dwellings are always challenging to deal with. And then we're talking about organics, and if people start diverting the organics for 70 percent waste diversion, we can make it in 2050. It's my pleasure to uh, moderate this last session, and we're calling it the Dragon's Den. I bet that, that Metro Vancouver and the municipalities buy hundreds of millions worth of stuff every year, and a lot of that stuff comes in way too much packaging. If Metro Vancouver and the municipalities said, we don't want that packaging, we won't buy from you unless you supply us without packaging or with very simple, easy to recycle packaging, it would start to have an impact on the businesses that supply governments as well as all of us as individuals. You bought a can of beans separately, you bought a cell phone separately, you bought a banana separately, you consumed them separately, and all we're asking folks to do is keep them separate. It was separate to start with. It's easy to justify all the reasons why you can, to think about cost, and, but if you don't take a step, you'll never directionally get to where you, you're going to go. For us, it's about being authentic, but at the same time, it's got to be something that people feel comfortable in hearing from London Drugs to make sure that they can work in partnership with us together <coughs> to help Metro Vancouver and, and all the communities we serve look at our waste challenges dramatically different in the future. Thank you for your time. We hope you will join us in the pledge and together we can make a difference. Thank you to Zero Waste Challenge. It's, it's a, a bit of a change in lifestyle, a bit of a change in your habits, and uh, I think it's worth it. I really do. Welcome back to the Sustainable Region and our look at food waste. Commercial food waste is the single largest contributor of organics into the waste stream, but households play a part too. Food waste from our kitchens makes up about 40% of what single-family households send to the landfill. That's about 50,000 tons a year. Well, recently Metro Vancouver conducted a waste audit to find out exactly what kind of food people are throwing away. The seemingly endless stream of trucks rolling into the Surrey transfer station is tangible evidence that we produce a lot of garbage. Almost a million tons of it every year. And a lot of it comes from our kitchens. Food either in the form of scraps or food that was purchased and never used. Metro Vancouver ordered a waste audit to find out how much residential food waste is ending up in the landfill instead of being composted or used to create biofuel. See some overpurchased bread here. Metro Vancouver it does this type of study to increase uh, its own awareness of what is going into the waste stream to try and help plan some of our diversion programs, some of our education programs. Awareness is, is a big start. We want to use that awareness and that information to change behavior, change habits of people. It's a dirty job. The auditors take random samples from garbage trucks carrying residential trash. Then they painstakingly sort what they find into separate categories and weigh the results. 
almost 40% of the, the waste stream from single family homes is made up of food waste of some type. If you look at what we think is the avoidable food waste, it works out to about 22 kilos per person per year. That means 12.7% of what we throw away is food that should never have been purchased in the first place. Municipalities save money in their collection costs and tipping fees. In Port Coquitlam, we've been able to save about $186,000 a year by just shifting our garbage patterns from solid waste to green waste. The unopened box of salad in this dumpster is typical of the kind of food that never gets used and inevitably ends up in the landfill. It's so much cheaper and better just to buy the head of lettuce than the plastic box that contains the lettuce that doesn't store it properly in your fridge. So, you know, we have to think about what we're buying and why we're buying it. And sometimes it's about convenience and we all live busy lives, but we got to think of the bigger picture when we're buying our food as well. The fact that we see so much avoidable food waste definitely suggests that people are often buying more food than they can really eat, possibly because some retailers are selling them in, in very large quantities packaged together. And we also see that a lot of the food has simply been kept past its expiry and as a result people just throw it out. In this society we have an abundance of available food and it starts with just having more of an awareness of how much you're buying and, and what you actually need. When you throw something away and you put it to the curb, it, it doesn't just end at the curb. I mean, there's a whole process around collecting it and bringing it to these transfer stations and disposing it in a proper way. People need to be aware of that. It actually starts with your purchasing habits, how you buy things, what type of materials you buy, are they recyclable, do you need all the excess packaging. It's not just the food that we're throwing out, but all the energy and fuel that it took to make that apple or that food, truck it to the store, buy it, take it home, leave it in a fridge for a while, and then throw it out unused. So there's a lot of environmental effects beyond just throwing the apple out. In fact, it's estimated that the massive volumes of water used to grow food that isn't eaten is equivalent to leaving the tap running and pouring four trillion liters of water right down the drain. Something to think about before your next trip to the grocery store. We all have too much stuff, but getting rid of it in a sustainable way is tough. Like all that old sports gear or that leftover paint that can't go to the landfill. Metro Vancouver's new We Recycle app turns your iPhone into a reuse and recycling powerhouse. It'll find the nearest place for your stuff to go. Simple, sustainable, everything has its place. We Recycle, now available in the App Store. Welcome back to the Sustainable Region and our show on food waste. We know that virtually all the food scraps we produce could be composted, but you might be wondering why disposing of organics through composting is any better than letting it decompose in the landfill. Well, actually, it's a lot better. It turns out that where we do compose food makes a big difference to the health of our planet. The way your garbage decomposes makes a big difference to the environment. Organic materials that are composted in the presence of oxygen create carbon dioxide. But if they decompose in a landfill, the byproduct is methane. When you bury plant materials in the dump, they generate methane gas, which is an enormously powerful greenhouse gas. Methane and carbon dioxide are both greenhouse gases. But methane remains in the atmosphere for 9 to 15 years and is 20 times more effective in trapping heat in the atmosphere than carbon dioxide. What is the link between methane and landfills? The answer lies in the type of organisms that do the work of decomposing. When plant material like food scraps or your yard scraps go to the dump, they get sealed inside plastic bags, they get buried under you know, feet and feet and feet of other garbage, and they don't get oxygen to them, so they break down anaerobically, which is the stinky sort of rot, it generates methane, uh, and can help speed climate change. 
Bacteria are all around us and they come in two forms, aerobic and anaerobic. Anaerobic bacteria consume organic materials but die if they come in contact with oxygen. They can be found in oxygen-free places like bogs and swamps, and in stomachs, animal hooves, and in landfills. For these anaerobic bacteria, their waste product is methane. But a banana or carrot peel that goes into a compost system gets consumed by aerobic organisms. That is bacteria that thrive in oxygen. When you do it in your backyard composter or you do it in a big windrow composting system, uh, it breaks down aerobically in the presence of oxygen and all you do is get the CO2 out that went into the plant when it was grown. This commonly happens in nature as droppings from animals and trees are usually in contact with oxygen. Landfills are among the top three sources of methane. In 2009 in Metro Vancouver, about 40% of residential waste could have been composted instead. Composting can be fun. Three, two, one, one. These engineers devised a pumpkin tossing device to get their organic objects into the compost. You may prefer a more efficient method. Just lay out a piece of newspaper or brown paper Collect your food scraps, roll it up, and toss it into the composter. Through 2011, most regional municipalities will be accepting scrapings from dinner dishes, peels and scraps from meal preparation, plant materials, and soiled paper in bins like these. Composting instead of trashing, one easy way to reduce your greenhouse gas emissions. Welcome back to the sustainable region. We've seen how important it is to compost. Well, some municipalities are allowing the residents to put their food scraps in with their yard waste and have it picked up. Soon that service will be expanded to everyone in Metro Vancouver, including people who live in apartments and condos. Here's a look at what needs to be done for that to happen. Metro Vancouver announced its curbside kitchen scraps collection pilot project in the fall of 2009 and since then the program's been expanded. The general idea is the container that you've been using to put yard trimmings in, you can now put in food scraps and in some cases soiled papers, depending on which municipality you're in. The things like tissues and paper towels, paper plates and pizza boxes. Sending food scraps to the landfill increases the region's waste management costs and more importantly, it leads to the release of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. That's why Metro Vancouver plans to ban kitchen scraps from single-family homes by the end of 2012, a ban that will be enforced through random inspections. We have inspectors and if they find that a load has an excessive amount of banned materials, then they assess a surcharge, 50% uh, and extra on the tipping fee. And so the municipality is hit with a extra cost and it's an incentive for them to go back to their residents and educate them further. The second organics ban is on multifamily homes and on commercial businesses. That's a little bit more difficult. The infrastructure for food scraps collection from those sources is less developed uh, and it needs to grow. Our plan is to start phasing in a ban so that we start sometime in 2012 and gradually increase it till we get to a full-scale ban in 2015. The bans are being phased in because separating and processing organics will require a major overhaul of the current waste management system. It's definitely achievable, it won't be easy, and it will require the, the building of a lot of new infrastructure, especially since the new tonnage we want to divert. Fully half of that is organics. 
And so there has to be a lot more organics processing capacity, new compost facilities, new biofuel facilities built in this region. Fraser Richmond Soil and Fiber is one of only two companies that can currently process food scraps. Here, compost can be turned into soil in just nine weeks. You see the bags and the brush behind us? That's eight weeks later. And then once it goes through the screen, we take the fines out, the stuff that's completed. It goes over for finished product there. The oversized pieces of wood go through a grinder then at that point and come back, in, loop back into the system. Compost can also be used to create biofuel. When food scraps decompose, methane is created, and that could be refined and used as a fuel. A new biofuel facility in Surrey will handle 80,000 tons of organics when it is completed. Food scraps from single-family homes will be banned from the garbage when all member municipalities have single-family organics collection in place. This is expected to occur by the end of 2012. By 2015, the ban will include multifamily dwellings and businesses. Remember, it's good to compost at any time of the year. And as you've heard, it won't be long before throwing food away won't even be an option. We hope you enjoyed our look at food waste and would love to hear your comments on the show. Let us know what you think about any of our shows, or feel free to provide ideas for future episodes. You can call us at 604-436-6794 or email us at sustainableregion at metrovancouver.org. And you can watch or share our videos at metrovancouver.org forward slash videos. For the Sustainable Region, I'm Dachmar Timmer. And I'm Vanessa Timmer. Thanks for watching. See you next time.